On today's show, I bring back Jeremy Booth. I got some emails from you guys, and I listened to you all, and you guys asked if I could bring Jeremy back on to talk a little more in depth about the scouting process after we just had the draft, and there was some confusion among some others. So we're excited to have Jeremy back on and hopefully clarify some things for you guys. Welcome to another episode of the Baseball Awakening Podcast, where we dive into the raw, unfiltered, unsexy side of player development. Get ready for some knowledge bombs with your host, Jeff Rottmeyer. Jeremy Booth is the founder and the CEO of Program 15 and the president of baseball operation for the New Balance Baseball Future Star Series, as well as the baseball analyst for CBS TV, KHOU 11 down in Houston, as well as co-host of the Extra Base podcast. Jeremy's reputation for being able to recognize and uncover players' potential is built on a diverse 18-year professional baseball career as a player, coach, and a talent evaluator. As a scout, Jeremy has consulted in the player development and scouting department for major league organizations to include the Minnesota Twins, Milwaukee Brewers, and the Seattle Mariners, where he signed players who went on to claim major exposure and professional success. With a passion and a drive to that earned him the respect of amateur baseball players, evaluation, and development world, Jeremy left professional baseball in 2016 to create Program 15, an organization dedicated to his vision to providing amateur players across all economic level an opportunity to reach their full potential through the learning, development, and guidance of former MLB players, scouts, and coaches. Jeremy, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm Jeff. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. You know, listen, since I've had you on last, you know, we had the, the draft. And um, I've had a couple people reach out to me, you know, and asking me if I could get you back on the show and maybe go a little more in depth. They they requested that I kind of take more of a structured approach. So, you know, um, I appreciate you coming back on. As I know, this is a very busy time for you. Oh, all good, man. You know, I love talking to you and, and talking the game. And you know, I, I thought I thought last time we spoke was pretty good. It was pretty organized, but uh, I, I thought though so too. So yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Let's we'll see if we can keep it direct. Let's we'll see if we can do what they need. All right. So let's just start with the eye test. What does the eye test mean, and and what are you guys looking for? You know, the eye test is is probably one of the broadest terms out there, right? Because it just says the eye. It's very subjective. But what that really means is that means uh, an appearance. It means, uh, you know, how the body works. It means athletic. It means projection. It means growth, strength, uh, life, things that say that a player at, I don't know, 17 or in Latin America, 14, you know, whatever the case may be when you see them, is not going to is going to continue to grow into it, right? It's going to be athletic. It's going to be durable. It's going to be flexible. You know, we, we use words like injury prone. And we use words like tight, and we use words like stiff, and, and things like that. And and those are just, you know those are terms that describe you know how the body really really works, right? How each player's body works. What it, what it means to sum it up is athletic, strength, life, fluid, projectable. If somebody has those type of things. Um, they're, they're passing the eye test. Uh, you know, you don't want to see a, a kid who, you know, this is going to sound bad, but who has bad, um, who has features that would, that would say in, in later years, it's going to thicken and be hard to maintain a full major league season. You want to have a certain frame on a player that says he can be durable and not get hurt and, and grow and, and add things to it, right? Not something that's all the way finished at 17 years old. So when we talk about the eye test, that's what we mean. Right. And, 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 and for the people that are listening, they're using their experience in evaluating players in that they're saying, okay, I've seen this type before and this one worked out. 
pretty well, and then this one didn't work out very well. Correct. That's what it means. Yes. So, so that's why when you see some guys that maybe they don't pass the eye test, it's because they have a feature that hasn't been proven to be sustainable. And you know what? That's that's kind of borne out over time too. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not right. something when you say that that is is made up yesterday. You know, that's been around. You know, it's so people have baseball players and athletes for for you know. Well, you know, decades and decades and decades, and um, there are certain players that look a certain way, and there's other players that look other ways. And if you look at the guys around Major League Baseball today, they get hurt a lot, um, you know, or you know have body issues with strength or conditioning or things like that. There's a certain type that comes with that. Now, it, it doesn't mean that a player who has a type that isn't, uh, you know, isn't 100 ideal can't play doesn't right. get selected, doesn't move on. Right. It, it just means there's there's kind of a checklist, and that's part of it. Right. So, so again, past experience matters. You know, we have to remember that these guys are trying to find guys that they feel like can play in the big league one day and help their team win some games. All right. So that's the eye test. Jeremy, I think you did a great job on that. So let, let's jump into the tools. Right. Um, let's start with the hit tool. What does that consist of? So the hit tool... Um, you know, is, is, can be as simple and as complex as you make it. And the best part about evaluators is that everybody's got their own lens, right? Um, when you're talking about scouting, and I'm going to, I will bring this back to each tool. But when you're talking about scouting before we get into the tools, it's important to remember that there's different lenses from, uh, from for each level. There's a, there's an amateur lens, which is, you know, traditionally United States amateur baseball, right? There's an amateur lens there, which is more tool focused. And the older you get, it becomes more skill oriented, right? And so the, what I mean is the more, the older you, longer you play and the older you get, the better your skills and production needs to be. All right. Um, things are, are, that are excusable at 15 are no longer excusable at 17. Things are excusable at 17, no longer excusable at 19, right? Because you're getting older and older and older in that, in that realm. So the lens changes a little bit on the amateur side with every passing year. Uh, there's the international lens where you're dealing with players who are, you know, by that we're mostly talking Latin America, but there's international lens where you're dealing with players who, um, you know, are younger, right? I mean, those kids are signing at 16, right? So they're younger. And um, it's, it's way more projection that goes into it when you start seeing those kids at 13 and 14 years old. And, and with our initiatives, you know, I'm doing that now. You know, down in Dominican, I see 13 and 14 year olds and I got, a, I got a dream and project and, and get them when they're 15, 16 to come over, which a lot right. happens in only a few months, let alone a couple of years, right? So you really have to, uh, you really have to, to dream there and, and use that lens. And there's the pro lens. And the pro lens is, is really skill oriented. There are certain tools, which is how I'm tying that back to what you asked, that need to check the box, certain levels of tools that need to check boxes to advance into professional baseball. Once you're in professional baseball, it becomes skill oriented. Right, it's it's different because the tools really do even out, and guys with a little lesser tools can be better players once you're in professional baseball, as long as they as long as they can execute. Okay, so back to hit. The hit tool has components. It has you know the ability to barrel the baseball. It has pitch recognition. It has feel to use the whole field. It has um, bat speed. It has hand strength. It has um, uh, you know balance. Those are all components. So physical approach and mental all go into the kid's ability to hit. You have one of the three, let's just call it physical, right? Um, that shows you have some kind of a chance to hit, but if you don't have the other two, eventually it's going to catch up to you, right? If you have pitch recognition and, and approach, but your physical tools are a little bit light, you know, those can be tightened up to a point and, and you can be passable and sometimes more successful with those things than a player who doesn't have the, um, doesn't have who has tools but not the other not, not the other two right or, or the physical attributes to hit but not the other two but the ideal holy grail is to find all of those things approach that works in all all fields the ability to uh you know control the barrel the ability to uh, see the baseball the ability to control strike zones and the ability to repeat his mechanics and all those things go into something we call the hit tool nice and, and you know what jeremy just to reiterate something that you said we have to understand that when you're 15, 
you can get away with more than you can when then when you're 17. You're, you're supposed to be getting better. So if you are a guy in college and you hit 15, 18 home runs, but you have trouble with the curveball or you have trouble with pitch recognition, that's a strike against you. 100%. There's a kid I signed in 2011 who's uh, currently rehabbing in, in Arizona with the Giants, but his name is Michael Reed. He's a fifth rounder, playing the big leagues for three clubs, uh, Milwaukee, Atlanta, and San Francisco. And, you know, Michael was a kid who had tools, right? But the skills were light. And what that means is that he saw the breaking ball, but he didn't really know how to hit it yet. Mm, if that makes sense yeah. to you. Okay. By the time he was seven, you know, 17, by the time he was 20, he had figured out how to hit the breaking ball. Mm. So in those three years, the, the adjustment went from the scouting identification was, does he see it? You could tell that he saw it by the way he took the pitches. You knew he saw it out of the hand. Wow. The question was, could he learn how to hit it? Yeah. And so at that point, over his development, he learned how to hit the break ball, if that makes sense to you. So yeah. if you're in college, using that as an example, yeah, at 17, hey, he doesn't hit the breaking ball yet. But at 20, no, you have to be able to make contact. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Then. And you know what? You know, if, if you're swinging that curveball and – you can, like, like you said, you can tell if if a guy's not seeing it well by the way he takes. Just like you said, and you know what, this right. doesn't help them because I had a guy reach out and he said, you know, I, I've been watching this kid. He had 17 home runs and he didn't have a, a single interest and he was super confused. But then I I went and watched, you know, a little bit on the things that I could find, and it seemed like he couldn't hit the curveball. The ability to make contact. Um, for a while was underrated. And I, I can never understand why because, you know, it transitions it to the other two tools we're about to talk about offensively. But the ability to make contact, um, you can't hit if you can't make contact. And if you can't hit, you're making a lot of outs. And if you don't make, you make outs and, you know, um, you ain't going to get a chance to play because the name of the game is to score runs and or prevent runs. Right? So, I, you know, I, it's, you have to be able to make contact and, and that's the hitability tool is, is all those things combined. Right, and we must understand that the competition level matters as well. Yeah, because well, it matters what the it matters what the the mix of those things we discussed. It matters how that right. comes together against that competition. Because um, I was a player I saw yesterday. I'll just give you an example: who is superior athletically to a lot of the players he's played against. Kid sixteen, and he had, his brain had made subtle adjustments in how he was doing things to slow himself down to play against his peers. It happens. People do it. People check out mentally a little bit because they love the game. They don't realize they're doing it. Um, and he's hustling. He's succeeding, but he's succeeding incorrectly. Right? And so that's part of things that guys do against competition that's a little bit inferior to their talent level. Um, but, you know, over time, that has to work itself out. So what you're looking at, it, looking at it is how he's going to perform yeah. in the big leagues. You're not looking yeah. at how he's going to perform in, in college because – I hate to say it, in college baseball, as exciting as it's become, um, because it has, and it's it's not the end-all, be-all. We're looking at the big leagues, and, and those kids, when they get done with college, they want to go play professionally, right? So it it ties into, is this going to work at the high level? Right, level? right. Okay. Um, I think we are, well, you explained the hit tool pretty well. So let's jump over okay. to uh, power. How is power evaluated? All right, there's two types of power. There's raw power and there's power production, okay? And raw power is simply how far can you hit it. That's easy. How far can you hit it? Strength, okay? And um, with once you check off a strength box, that's the raw, that's the raw power, right? The one that matters, the one that, that drives and runs is power production. And that is, to me, that's a mix of things. So some people would say power production is frequency of home runs, Okay. How many home runs is he going to hit? And again, to, to the listeners, this is the big leagues. This is not he hit eight home runs in college or 16 home runs in high school. This is right. projection in the big leagues. Right. So power production and several things go into that. Um, it, it, it's not it's just just with home runs. It, it's it's free, it's frequency of that. But for me, it's extra base hits. So if I'm looking at power production, I'm talking about doubles, triples, non-singles. How many, how many hard contacts for extra bases do I think this guy is going to get? Now, that is a completely dreaming and guessing number, 
Okay. But, but the grade isn't, you know? So if you're going to give a guy, let's say six power, um, that means he's going to hit somewhere between, you know, 19 and 25 home runs. Okay. Or 22 to 27, whatever your scale is. All right. 19 to 25 is about, more, about right. So if you're going to, if you're going to do that, you also have to add in the extra base hits with it. Now the components are everything right. we talked about in the hit tool, right? But now this adds the strength into it and how often he's going to get to the strength based on his approach for people who are pull oriented. Um, you're going to get a little bit of a higher for most people, at least for me, you get a little bit of a higher power grade than you do a hit grade because you're giving up the, you know, two thirds of the field. If you're just trying to pull the baseball and, and, and pitchers will run into a certain make mistakes in certain areas where if you're a pull guy, you're going to run into enough as long as you can hit, you know, as long as the boxes are getting checked, right, to be able to play. But it pushes you down the list. If you're a guy that has power and shows me the ability to hit, you have raw power and shows me the ability to hit, I'm going to believe you're going to get to your power. So that right. drives both grades up, all right? Those guys go ahead of people who just have raw power, right, or right. people who can just hit. So power production is the one everybody wants, and that, and that's kind of how you get to it, strength. Um, speed and all the components we talked about it combined. Yeah, and, and you know what? For for the people that are listening, um, on MLB TV during the draft, they had a uh, a bunch of write up on you know the top two hundred guys that were supposed to be drafted. And when you read through them, there were a couple of guys that they were they were concerned that to whether they would hit enough to tap into their power. So I mean, you gotta you gotta hit, you gotta barrel up baseball before the power tool is realized. Yes, you do. That's that's no question. So we got to get into a situation where with those guys, where if you're you know you can swing all you want, swing as hard as you want, but it's not going to matter um, with as much strength if you can't make consistent hard contact. And that goes back to that whole hit for power. The phrase with that is hit for power. It's not power for hit, which is you know a difference with raw power. All right, all right, awesome, Jeremy. So now, so now we've covered um, hit and we've covered uh, power. Let's jump over to speed, the speed tool. How is how is one evaluated on speed? Um, so first of all, there's there's raw um, there's raw speed, okay, and raw speed is is stuff like you know we'll just use it when everybody knows it's sixty times. You know, what is it in 60 time? How fast is he, right? Um, then there's playable speed, which is, you know, home to first, right, off the bat, and there's first to third. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, the 10 and the 40 are more applicable measures for playable baseball speed based on the distances you run. But um, 60 is kind of the, the measuring stick for raw speed, right? Um, for those of you that don't understand the 60 or why we do it, and it's been accepted for so long, you know, I can't answer for everybody. I can answer for me. I do it for athleticism, body control, uh, explosion, right, and, and durability of, of speed. And what that basically means is how, how fast you get the top speed and how long can you yeah. maintain it. That's what it means, okay? All those things come together, show me a measure of athleticism. That's what the 60 shows me, okay? Um, the 10 shows me how fast you get the top speed, and the 40 shows me how, you know, an applicable game measurement that's pretty playable, right, whether it's home to first or you know, even first to third, even though that's a little longer, but um, the bursts are closer to 40 yards than they are, you know, 60. So um, that, that said, the running speed is, is essentially how you, you know, how your raw score is. And there's a playable running speed, which has to do with base stealing, right? Can you steal bases? Can you use it? Um, you know, do you make contact and get down the line in, in, a, in 4-2, which is a, a plus runner for the right-hand side, and 4-1 uh, four for a left-hand side, which is a plus runner, right? Do you do that? Um, and then, of course, first third times and, and everything that has to do with game applicable measurements is really how you're graded once the raw score of do you have foot right. speed comes into play. Right. So going back to those those things we talked about, about, you know, skill, you know, checking things off with tools, raw tools um, and those lenses. Right. People will have, be able to be a six five runner and they won't get drafted because yeah. they can't run steel bases. Right. Or they can't get down the get down the line. People can have plus raw power and not get drafted and hit, you know, 10, 15 home runs in college and not get drafted yeah. because they can't use it because the next level doesn't right. project to use it because it's all for power. Right. So uh, if you're looking at the draft, not understanding, you know, the, the science within it, this is part of it. There's plenty of guys. I saw three guys yesterday run a six, six, 
oh. at 16 years old, three of them. But if I don't believe it's going to play, right? right? I don't believe it's going to play. It's right. a small workout we had yesterday, you know, 20 guys, right? If I don't believe it's going to play, it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. To, that 6-6 six, six doesn't matter. So there's the raw score, and then there's the playable score, and the playable score is everybody wants. Okay, yeah, you know, so not so not to get off topic here, but for for, for the people that are listening, I had a, a gentleman email me, and he then wanted the uh, kind of the northern states, and, and he asked me, uh, how do you evaluate um, athleticism? And, uh, you know, that's always a, a good question, but I, I simply said that, you know, you, you've got to go where the great players are at. And you will see the athleticism in these guys. And you'll be able to see it and then be able to go back home and compare it. Compare the athleticism from what you're seeing versus that. And, but but you got to see it enough. You know, you got to go to spring training. You got to go to big league games. You go to the top high school and college of men. And you'll see the athleticism. And then you just take that back home with you and then be able to compare to. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, but, you know, again, all those things we talked about, even from the eye test, right, down to some of the things that I just mentioned with measurements going to athleticism. Right, right. But but what I'm saying is if they've never seen it, if they've never seen a big leaguer and how athletic he is and how he moves, it's going to be tough for them to to look at a kid and, you know, wherever they're from and say, this is the future big leaguer. Correct. Okay. So we talked about the hit. Um, we talked about power. We talked about speed. Let's jump over to uh, the arm. All right. Um, what, what do you got there? So, you know, obviously raw arm strength, right? And, you know, that can mean anything from, you know, a radar gun reading um, for pitchers or, um, a radar or throwing the ball, or even now it's a radar gun reading from position players, but throwing the ball from, you know, right field in the test into the se- seventh row. That's raw arm strength. Okay. Um, but again, none of it matters unless it plays. So if a kid comes through or a player comes through and he yeah. throws it as hard as he can and, and it's, in, it's in the ninth row, man, that's great. Now, can you execute it? Otherwise, you're just making errors and guys are, right, just going to keep circling the bases. It's the same thing with a pitcher. Pitcher can throw 95, 97, 98, 92, 90, you know, 104. If you can't put it in the strike zone and actually have some kind of field to command it, believe it or not, um, and I know you believe that, but some people who are listening may want to, you know, hey, it's 104. It, you know, it's got to be in the, it's got to be right. usable, 104. It doesn't matter. So you have to look at the raw, and then you have to take that in and, 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 and put it into your lens of, is this going to be something that's going to work? Does he repeat his, or his feet underneath him, which was an accuracy and playability. Does he stay above the baseball when he throws? Is his body online? Um, does he have wasted footwork and mechanics? Is, he, is, is something out of sync in how he's releasing the baseball? Does his arm action work, which is you know, now undervalued, in my opinion. But you know, does, does his arm action work? Yeah. Is it something that he's going to get hurt? I mean, we have now have position players having Tommy John surgery and, uh, at, at, at rising rates, and that's really concerning. Concerning. It's you see, it's more concerning than pitchers. If that tells us we're already that something is inherently wrong yeah. with how things are happening to develop players younger, yeah. which is a different topic, but it ties back into the tool of arm strength and playability. Right. So raw arm strength and then the skill to be playable arm strength, and playable arm strength is what you get graded on. You know, yeah, it's a seventy arm, but it grades as an it's a five, really. It's an average arm because that's how it plays. Or it's a 98-mile-an-hour fastball, but it's out of the zone at 98, so it's a 92 in the strike zone, so it's really an average fastball. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's kind of how you, how you look at it um, when you're grading things out as you go further. So, uh, you know, again, for people who haven't, who haven't done it, just on the educational side of it, you know, the raw tool is great. The playable tool is what matters. And whether the people, you know, sell that or, or tell you that or, you know, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter what. This is going to sound really cold, but you know, Jeff, I think you know enough about me now to know that I'm going to say what's on my say what's on my mind. It's going to sound really cold. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It doesn't matter what you think or I think or the the guy down the street thinks or the guy next. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This you're not going to change that by saying, "Oh, it's 98. He deserves to play." No, he doesn't. If it, unless it's 98 in the strike zone, then that's then you got something. 
right? And and, and then and then within that, right. Jeff, to go into the um, to the arm strength, you're talking about what kind of arm is it? And what that means is it is it a right field arm? Is it a shortstop arm? Is it uh, does it play from behind the plate? Right? Is it is it is it an arm action that's going to sustain a pitcher on the mound being a starter over time, or is it something that is different that has to put him in the bullpen because of the risk on it? All of those things matter. And I think mm-hmm. in our first conversation, we talked about roles, right? Like building into roles. And we talked about usable tools. Right. And it's kind of like, yep. it's kind of back into that to explain what that means. So if I'm a, if I'm a pitcher and I have a 95 mile an hour fastball, and that 95 better work or it don't matter. And, and if I can do that as a starter, right. then that bumps my value up as opposed to somebody else who has to go into the bullpen because there's a lot of those guys. And so the answer is the arm strength is not just as simple as a raw arm grade. Yes, there's a raw arm grade, but how it really is evaluated is what it's going to play, how it's going to hold up, and, and what position it's going to be at, which goes into a whole other thing, which I'll tie in together at the end when, uh, when we talk about draft profiles. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And you know what? For the people that are listening, again, this this is not easy. There are a lot of things that – we don't realize that they're looking at in terms of, and, and again, you know, they're they're looking at someone that they think could be a big leaguer and help their team win games one day. You know, does he have the mechanics? Does he have the fundamentals? Does he have the body type? Uh, there's a lot more to it than you know, just being a guy. You know, not the radar gun says ninety two, and he has a, a ranking on him. Right. Okay. Yep. So. um so, so we talked about the the hit tool. We talked about the power tool. We talked about speed. Um, we talked about arm. So now, now we have fielding. So, so Jeremy, what what goes into evaluating fielding? Fielding is okay. So let's go back to all those components, right? Run speed and athleticism. And people will say that doesn't matter, but it obviously does. Okay, run speed, foot speed, athleticism, yeah. arm strength. All of those, believe it or not, go into your defensive grade because it goes back to where, where a player is going to play, right? So you're talking about rhythm. You're talking about how soft his hands are. You're talking about footwork. You're talking about body life. You're talking about range. You're talking about um, making the routine play. You're talking about instincts. All those things go into some, a player's defensive ability. All of them. And – you know, most people say, oh, you know, he's got soft hands and he makes, he, 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 pick, he executes the play. Well, that's part of it. It is part of it. Um, but everything else I just mentioned is our separators within that basic guideline. So the first thing you look for is how do the hands work? How do the feet work? Right. Um, can he, can he pick the ball up without, without a, without a hiccup? Does he execute it across? Yeah, he does. Okay, good. Now let's start talking about all the other things. You know, he, does he, he, he has endurance. He has explosion. He has a quick first step. He has instincts. He has um, ability to throw from different angles. He has feel. He has athleticism. He has, uh, you know, uh, range. He has, you know, he's a ball hawk. Different term, you know, th- things like that. Consistency and execution, right? Those are all things that go into a player's fielding mm-hmm. ability, whether or not he's a, a two or an eight, and two being a, a, a no value and eight being a, Gold Glover, right? So it's it's it really depends on on all of those factors to get the fielding ability, and within that, with all those things considered, you should get your grade. Now, this is where scouting gets, and I think that's all of the five, right? That's all five. Where scout this is where scouting gets. Um, it's interesting, is because people like back that lenses comment. People will have different lenses and they won't think as advanced as, as others. And part of that's just development and part of that's just scouting and, and, and seeing players over time to grow into what these tools actually mean. It's not ever going to be a science where somebody mm-hmm. wakes up and like, oh man, I got all these different checklists of what it looks like. And I feel like in, in our society, you know, as, as a baseball community, I feel like we've dumbed this down a little bit. Um, and, and we haven't found players who can do these things because we've stopped teaching it. I'm not going to get, I, like, I have a real yeah. strong feeling of who caused that. I do. Everything has a root cause somewhere. Right. And I have a real strong feeling of who caused that. That's not right. the point of the conversation. The point of the conversation is to say those right. things go into those tools. Now, every, when you're talking about draft position, are you talking about why a guy got selected? Are you talking about why a guy didn't get selected or what the future is going to hold for a certain player? All of those five tools add into what most people have now commonly dubbed the sixth tool, and that's your mental 
ability to process. That's your makeup. That's your instincts. That's your uh, resiliency. That is your um, cognitive ability. That is your all those things that go on above the neck. Okay, that ties into what the sixth tool. What's how's your head work? And your head, and if you have the the basic raw tool uh, boxes checked, right? Your head will get the most out of those tools through processing those tools into skills, back to our first conversation, right? And execution. And if you can tie those raw tools together with skill execution, you go, you have a role. And the roles are really dictated for the ease of operation of everybody else. Can you play in the middle of the diamond or can't you? And that means center field, shortstop, catcher. If you can play in those positions, right, the pressure, and, and, and it's because everybody's got to hit. Everybody's got to hit, but the pressure to, on the bat is less because they're premium defensive positions. It's changing some with some of the analytical shifting, right? It's changing a little bit with some of those things because people are, yeah. are, are you know, seeing a, a generation of hitters now who is so pull power oriented that they're able to stack up fielders on the other side of the, of, of, you know, on the pull side of the second base. And, and it changes the, the need for range because we're only playing on one side of the field, right? However, we have seen recently yeah, right. more and more players saying, you know what, man, I don't want to make an out by hitting, by rolling over something. I'm, go, I'm just going to throw something the other way. And I got a double and I got a base hit, right? And help my team. The fans are going nuts for it because it's back to playing real baseball. So as that comes back, yeah. as players realize I'm a dumb so-and-so for trying to yank everything to the first baseman or the third baseman, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to get, now I'll pad my average. I'm going to go get some, get on second base. I'm going to drive and run. I'm going to be a team player. I'm tired of making outs. The more that happens, the more those tr- more traditional profiles will come back of, 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 can you play short? Can you play center? Can you, can you catch? And that's, that's happening. Now, if you can't play in those positions at the big league level, you have to move. And if you have to move, you got to hit third base, first base, left field, right field, second base, all got to rate all of them, all of them. And if you look around baseball, the yep. teams that win in those positions have guys that can flat hit and hit for power. It's not one or the other. It's hit and hit for power, right? Maybe varying degrees of that, but hit and hit right. for power. There are cases where we have what's called a secondary profile, okay? And the secondary profile is, is a guy who, let's play, says, play left field. Um, but, you know, his arm is just okay. It's a 40 arm on a scale of two to eight. It's a four arm. Um, and the power's a, a three, but he's an eight runner, right? He's a seven defender, which you can be with a forearm because you take everything away, right? And you've got a six bat. So it's a little upside down, but, the, but there's, a, so there's a, a couple of tools in there that are top end tools that creates value as a, as a, as a leadoff hitter or a two hitter or um, who, who, who can go take throws, who balls away and left. You know what I'm saying? There's other ways to do it that give you premium a value to play a position instead of a traditional hit hit for power that would go with a left fielder. Okay. But all of those things come into play as far right. as where you get drafted, what your positioning is on the board and, and what your future projection is. And so for people out there who are watching stats and people out there who are watching players that have these raw tools um, and wondering maybe why a certain player goes here and a certain player doesn't go there or how that's flipped, all those things go into play. And when you add the analytical component in it, we go back to your comment about competition, right? Who's he playing against? Who's he doing it against? How consistent yeah. is it? Um, and how familiar and comfortable are, are we with that player? And all those things tie together with your tools. So you have your five tools that are, that are you know, raw and, and skill within them. Um, you have your lenses of how that's evaluated. You have your six tool of your mental state and what your brain can do to help you achieve what people would call your ceiling and that's as high as you can go. And then you have the uh, primary and secondary profiles that would dictate where you would sit on a draft board and your value to a club, which is purely how you get selected and how you get paid. And so that should, while it's being very complex, and I know people are going to have to probably listen to this a couple of times, it takes a long time to get it. It takes a long time to get it and understand it. Um, that's how you can develop into an evaluator, and that's how you can develop an understanding the draft. And if you're a player, that's how you can understand where you might fit. Yeah, it, it does take a long time. You know, this is something that I've been kind of interested in the last three, four years, trying to watch as many guys, and I still don't have a clue on a lot of this stuff. You know, I mean, and, and again, that's just like the game of baseball. You know, there's always something to learn. So, so anyways, uh, you know, for, for the people that are listening, 
you know, how many tools, you know, because not everybody's a five tool guy. So how many tools does a guy need to be able to capture your attention and spend some time scouting? Well, there's not really a minimum. Um, we, we can say is you can go back to that, you know, primary and secondary profile, right? Um, and what I, w- what I would say with yeah. that is that there's also something, and so, you know, this, again, this is getting a little advanced, but there's also something called the three-two rule. And that is if you take the, the positions on the field, the eight positions on the field, there's five tools that go into every position, right? And they rank in certain order. So we'll go back to left field, right? Hit, hit for power, um, you know, run, defense, throw, whatever your, pr- your, your preference is on as an organization, okay? But hit and hit for power are always the first two. If you have the first three tools out of any position, the other two tend to not matter. Catcher, for example, right? The, the last uh, graded tool or last prioritized tool on a catcher is foot speed. Nobody cares if a catcher can run, right? So if you're putting that as part of his evaluation, yeah, right. it can help if he can do it. But to hurt him or ping him because he can't isn't, isn't necessarily you know, prudent, right? If he can throw, he can defend, and he can hit, which are the first three, right. you're pretty happy. See what I'm saying? So you want to kind of check those boxes when you're putting yep. out about where a guy's going to be able to play with those primary tools. Now, again, there's other guys, like I said, who have secondary profiles and, and things that are maybe a little bit upside down, but give you the ability to see or have the ability for you to see they can execute and have value. But when you're talking about the primary profile, that's not really a minimum. It's more of where do I play him and what are the tools that show me he can play? Now, where players get into trouble is if they're misfits. So a guy's got raw power, but he, you know, yeah. um, and he can run, right? But he can't play first base because he, you know, he's bad defensively, and he, he can't, or he can't play third because he's bad defensively. He doesn't make enough contact, um, uh, you know, to project as a as a run producer across the diamond, and so he's limited defensively, uh, and it's it's hit over power or what? You know, there's something in there that doesn't make sense for a guy that we don't have a place to put him doesn't mean he won't get drafted. This doesn't mean where you're going to put him because at some point that's going to catch up when he starts running into guys who do have places to play, right? Who do fit those primary and secondary profiles. Yeah. So um, that's, that's the, the answer. Like I said, it takes a long time to get this. It, it, it takes years of, of seeing yeah. players and mentorship and understanding the analytical component and the profile component and the gameplay and how fast the game moves at different levels in the system um, to achieve it. But you can get there. You can get there. Okay, cool. So that covers the position tools. Um, I think we did a pretty good job staying on topic. Um, so, so let's jump over to pitching. All right. Um, we talked a little bit about the arm. Um, is, is there anything you want to elaborate on, on the pitching side when it comes to the arm? Not so much the arm, but more about the execution and more about the role and more about projection. And I can sum up pitching pretty easily. Okay. Um, when you're looking at a pitcher, you're looking at um, body, arm action, delivery, athleticism, same stuff you're looking at as a position player, only the arm action delivery have a little, uh, have more of a priority, right? Um, you want to see somebody who has innings in him. You want to see somebody who has obviously arm strength, but you want to see somebody who can command it, has what I would call just a heavy baseball, a ball that has, um, you know, a term people use is late life. But something that's hard to lift, you don't want to see that. You don't want to see balls that we call light, something that's tough to lift. You want to see players or pitchers that have a secondary feel and can throw multiple pitches for strikes um, with quality. And the reason why you want to do that is because all of those things and the varying degrees of, of ability to do them give you a role. If a guy has a really good arm, he's probably going to get a shot. There's no, de- no denying that. Okay? But if he can't throw his breaking ball for a strike, and it's a below average pitch or he has no protection, it's going to limit his ability to a number for number one, be a starter. Number two, have impact in a bullpen role because when he gets back to the bullpen, as soon as guys figure out that he's only got one pitch, they're just going to wait on that one pitch and the rest of it doesn't matter. Right? So pitching really becomes about durability, role, longevity, execution, and uh, quality. And those are, it's a way shorter explanation than, than position players because there's there's it's really a, it's it's a, a box you can check pretty easily by watching a guy throwing in it. You watch a guy throwing in it, you kind of got a feel, you know. So that's 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 the pitching part. So I had a a question come in, and this was a a guy who 
has uh, a desire to be a professional scout one day. And he said, you know, he went out and watched a bunch of games in the spring, and there was a kid that was throwing 90, 92, 93, top down 95. But he was kind of on the chunkier side body type. You know, he, so he didn't have the ideal body, but he had the velocity. He was, okay. he was able to get guys out. Um, he 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 goes. Man, I just knew this kid was going to get drafted because uh, he was he was something special, and there was nothing. He not a single not a single interest. You know. So can you kind of go over maybe some of the other pieces that this gentleman maybe should have watched while he was you know evaluating this kid? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen the guy, but right. is there a break, is there a breaking ball? Right. Is, how's his arm work? Is there a delivery there? I mean, there's lots of guys who have been thicker pitchers that have pitched in the big leagues. Right. It, it, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. It just it really is the other factors within that. Ninety two ninety five is great, but is it playable? Is it heavy? Right. heavy? Um, is there a slider to go with it? Is he a reliever? I mean, you know, there's so many so much to unpack within what he. Within that explanation, I, what I would say is I think that's a good example of arm strength isn't enough. That's what I would say. I think arm strength isn't enough. That's a good answer. So, so I hope people are that that are listening. You know, I hope you guys realize that, that there's a lot to this than just the numbers and the staff. Um, like like Jeremy's been saying. So, all right, Jeremy, let's let's cover one more topic. Let's talk about um, makeup. Um, how do you, how do you evaluate makeup? Sure. So, you know, makeup is, is, is resiliency. Makeup is determination. Makeup is composure. Makeup is being a good teammate. Makeup is discipline. Makeup is, um, ability to handle, which goes back to composure, handle yourself in the big moments. Makeup is, um, character, which is a little bit different than on-field makeup. That's more off-field makeup, but I, I think they go hand-in-hand hand for me. Um, there's plenty of, of guys who have been you know, good teammates that don't have great character um, or not have good teammates, but good players don't have great character, but at some point that character is going to show up in the clubhouse and, and you know, while it takes all different kinds to be part of a winning club, you know, people that get, can get along with other people and people that um, you know, have that ability to have that just innate personality about them to take care of their business and do the right thing and stay out of trouble. Those that's all makeup. Right. Um, so, you know, all that stuff kind right. of factors in, um, when you're really talking about makeup though, from a baseball standpoint, you're talking about on field makeup, how do you carry himself? How does teammates respond to him? Um, leadership ability, um, understanding of self, uh, you know, winning type composure and makeup resilience. It's game, the game will humble you. And, and we've talked about this before. Um, there's two types of people in baseball, and that's those that are humble and those that are about to be. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a situation that, uh, you know, some people today, and it's funny, I had an exchange on Twitter a couple of days ago where somebody was arguing against being humble. And if you're arguing against having humility, mm -hmm. Uh, you're up, set up for a big, a long road. It, it is a big planet, okay? And there is always somebody out there who's your equal or superior in some way. And it doesn't make you inferior because that happens. But, you know, I'm not a good cook, okay? I'm just not a good cook. Like I've, I've lived my life in hotels for 20 plus years, and, and I'm not a really good cook when I get home. I can cook a few things. Right. There are people who are better cooks than me. It doesn't make me an inferior human being, you know? I, I couldn't run. And there are people who are who run six one sixties. It doesn't make me an inferior human being. It just means you got to accept there's other people out there who are good at things, and you have to have some kind of respect for your fellow man, and, and some kind of respect for your for different cultures, and, and respect for um, good evaluators and different components and good players. And if you don't have that humility, it will come out as arrogance instead of confidence and cockiness, which is okay. Right, you got to have confidence, and you got to have some cockiness to be successful in a dog eat dog world and a dog eat dog game where nothing can bother you and phase you, and that is makeup as well. But it doesn't mean you have to be arrogant. Um, and I'm, I'll dive into this for you know five seconds because I don't want to beat the kid up. But um, there's a pitcher for Louisville, and I'm gonna leave his name out of it because everybody knows what I'm talking about in College World Series in the night. Um, yeah. Struck a kid out through a great game to that point. Struck a kid out, stared at him, which is whatever. But then he was started screaming profanities at him. All over national TV, 
Yeah. That does not show me composure. I don't care what they're doing to you unless somebody comes at you. That doesn't show me good on-field makeup. It doesn't. Now, in the heat of the moment, you guys yeah. stare at each other. Man, that's baseball. That's sports. You know, you want to celebrate for striking them out in that type of big right. situation in CWS, fine. To go where that kid went is, is just too far. I don't know the kid personally. I don't know the moment. I don't know the situation. I don't know all that. So I'm not going to judge him. What I am going to say is that doesn't show any humility and doesn't show that he can handle those type of moments. And sure enough, the next inning, next inning, he gives it up. Now, look, it could have been, you know, ninth inning, could have been a lot of pitches, could have been just bad execution, whatever the case is. But, you know, that's not part of makeup, right? That's part of everybody's going to start rooting against you. Yeah. So I I just, when I'm saying makeup, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about all those things coming together to factor into uh, becoming a winning player and positive impact on the club. That's makeup. Awesome. So, you know, for, for the people that are listening, uh, let's ask, uh, Jamie, let me ask you one more question. Um, and, and you don't have to elaborate on it. Um, we talked about this in great, in great depth on our last conversation. So you can catch that on that. Anyway, talk a little bit about, about skills. So we, we've been talking about tool. Talk about skills. Yeah. Well, well, skills is, is the level of execution of all, of all your tools, right? That, that's, you know, making the routine play or, uh, making the, 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 you know, the extra play or getting the balls you're not supposed to or the ability to make consistent contact or the ability to execute your fastball, um, to, to get swing and misses in and out of the zone, to put the baseball when you want to. Those are all skills, right? Stealing bases. Base stealing is a skill. Um, you know, uh, making the play in the hole is a skill. Making the routine play is a skill, right? Driving the ball the other, other way is a skill. Those are all skills. Um, the strength that comes from that is tools. The separation is the ability to do it. And, um, you know, those skills are ultimately what, what advance you through the game once you have certain tool markers. And so, uh, you know, tools versus skills is always a, a, a conversation that's had. Somewhere we started mistaking tools for skill. We started calling raw power a skill, and it's not a tool. And some people, somewhere that, that flipped, and it needs to go back to power production, how many times, how many extra base hits you get is your skill. So um, that's the difference, right? It's it's raw tool versus execution of that tool. All right, awesome. Well, Jeremy, you know, man, it's always uh, it's always great to have you on. It's always great to hear from you and and learn from you. So I appreciate you coming on and helping our our listeners. Hopefully, we've uh, kind of cleared uh, maybe some some questions that they had. Yeah, man. Appreciate it as always and, and look forward, you know, look forward to the next time and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for having me back.